So Okay, welcome to this edition of the Arctic Summer College. Um, thank you for dialing in. I see that we have uh, so far four participants in the, uh, in the audience, so we'll wait a little bit more. I see more people coming in, so we have, uh, as usual, some, uh, some trickling in at the beginning. I hope you enjoyed last week's session. I hope you're also happy uh, with the conversation regarding your publications and papers so far. Again, if you have questions, uh, please reach out to coordinator at arcticsummercollege.org and uh, responses will come primarily from Brendan, but I will also, of course, be available for any questions that you might have. And uh, feel free to also send us any comments or follow up on the sessions as, uh, as you can also do via the Facebook group if you use Facebook. So some of you don't, I know, so uh, for those who don't use Facebook, you can always come and email us. And of course, also ask questions during the sessions. And today's session, I'm very glad we have two excellent speakers. Uh, we start with, um, our first speaker, Anna Kertula de Echave. You, you can hear me? Um, it seems you can hear me. Okay. Okay. I yes, think you're back. I'm back. Okay. So that was just a connection problem. So if you have any issues, uh, I think Bernd also couldn't hear me. That's interesting. So that was maybe a problem with the webinar software. I promise not to touch any buttons here. If you have uh, trouble hearing me or if anything disappears, do as Bernd did already. You can ask a question in the question function and you can also use the chat function to reach out. And of course, if none of this works, you can always email. And again, reminder, if you drop out of the call, you can just use the same link to come back in if there's a problem on your so now, um, yeah, and our second speaker, I'll introduce the speakers later in more detail, but Inotech Holm Olsen is then our second panelist uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we also have on the, on the video um, session, Andreas Kremer uh, as the founder of the Arctic Summer College. And I'm glad Andreas made it. And I hope Andreas can also ask some questions later on to both our panelists. So now let's start with our first speaker, Dr. Anna Kertula de Echave. Um, hello, Andreas, now we can see you. So welcome uh, from Berlin. So we have participants on both sides of the Atlantic as usual. Anna, you work with the National Science Foundation. You're the director of the Arctic um, social sciences program there. You're an anthropologist and have done a tremendous amount of research with different populations in across the entire Arctic, including, as I've seen, Russian Arctic, and, uh, and of course, you're a native Alaskan. So obviously, you know, Alaska also um, pretty well, or, or your, um, um, and, and of course, other regions of the Arctic as well. You've done research in various fields, and I'm really glad that you're here today with us and will give us some insights. At least I know it's a very limited time frame, so I will cut, it, cut myself off here and uh, yield the floor to you. And of course, everybody is invited to ask questions directly after the presentation. And if you want to ask something, you can either use the question function or the chat box function. You can do this anytime during the presentation and we'll then respond directly afterwards, except of course, if they're technical issues or uh, direct understanding questions. So uh, with that, I wanna hand over. And um, Anna, just so you know, right now, we don't see your screen, just, um, for that. 
Okay. Huh. Okay. When I shared screen, it went right into my full. Oh. Okay. That's wow. fine. Okay. There. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. You've been made a presenter. Show my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Now we can. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry for being technologically challenged. Okay. Great. Um, I guess I'm on. I want to apologize for my messy office. I'd like to say it's because NSF is moving soon, but unfortunately it's not. My office always kind of looks this way. So uh, when I open my presentation, I will, you won't be able, I will turn off my camera so you don't have to look at my messy office anymore. Uh, I also want to say uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you in particular, uh, Gus, for putting this together. And um, Inotech, I want to thank you and I want to ask for your forgiveness a little bit. I'll let everybody know I have no research experience and very little personal experience in Greenland. So I'm sure everyone looks forward to what will be a very interesting presentation. And thank you for joining the group. Um, as I was introduced, I'm the director of the National Science Foundation's program for Arctic Social Sciences. I'm a native of the Arctic, both ancestral by being Karelian Finn, and uh, I was born in the state of Alaska, so born and raised. But I'm also an Arctic scientist. Uh, the first thing I want to say before I share the screen of my presentation, and we're going to have to look at it in presenter view because I don't have, didn't have time to print out notes, so you're all going to have to see the presenter view. Um, I first want to say that it is uh, strange sometimes to be the social scientist talking about Arctic people because obviously I cannot represent Arctic people. So I will put on my Western academic hat and just speak very broadly. Um, I also want you to know that um, I'm going to speak in very broad generalities. There's a lot of detail whenever we, all, whenever we talk in the lecture series about um, any particular group or even our science, sometimes it seems overly simplistic. So I apologize in advance if this seems overly simplistic, but I want to give a little bit of a feel for um, some of the processes that are happening in the Arctic that um, come to play today. And also I know there are a number of people online who are not social scientists or probably not specialists in the social history of the Arctic and Arctic peoples, and so I want to touch on some of that and what some of the key issues are. So I'm going to share my um, my screen, and before I continue, can somebody tell me that they can hear me uh, through a note? Um, yes, can we you... can hear you. Perfect. Hear Thank you. you. I just <laughs> wanted to be sure I wasn't talking to myself. Okay, uh, I'm going to shut my my visual off. And my screen is shared, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. And I'm going to put it into, sorry for closing a few of these windows, and I will put it in presenter view. Okay, there we go. So I already introduced myself, told you a little bit about myself, and you can also read my notes if you want, um, that there's a lot of territory to cover. So again, forgive me for speaking in generalities and forgive me for talking um, as an expert. I'm not an expert whatsoever. Um, it would obviously be much more interesting. Unfortunately, you're going to get to hear from Inutuk, who is himself a Greenlander and uh, will be able to talk about Greenland. Uh, so you've probably all seen, okay, it's going to make me do this. You've all seen this picture um, from the Arctic Human Development Report. It's about uh, 10 years old, a little over 10 years old. Uh, basically making the point, it, the Arctic is a very diverse social cultural space. Approximately 4 million people plus or minus live there. 400,000 are indigenous of indigenous peoples 
about 100,000 are in Russia, 200 in Alaska, uh, 50,000 in Greenland, I think that number is larger now, and about 50,000 people in Canada. So forgive me for having uh, an old map and old numbers. They occupy nine countries, uh, 46 distinct cultural groups, um, including both indigenous peoples and non-indigenous, um, 41 distinct cultural groups in Russia alone. Russia has a great diversity, and you can see a few I've named, the Chukchi, the Yukagir, the Evan, the Evan, the Nenets, uh, the Aleut, uh, etc. So there's a lot of differences between uh, these populations, and we could talk about them certainly linguistically, culturally, historically, um, etc., that it's very difficult to talk about Arctic peoples in general, but we do talk about Arctic peoples in general. And one of the reasons, of course, is because of the geographic area and because it's becoming much more interesting to a lot of people today for a variety of reasons, some because they're interested in natural resource development, some because of movements and sovereignty, others because of the geographic space and the, the fact that the Arctic Ocean is melting. So there's a lot of regions. But there are some similarities, some very broad similarities, and one is the low population density. People of the Arctic account for less. Now your audio dropped. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So do we get low population density? Yes. Okay. Yes. So they occupy a very large uh, amount of land with very low population density um, in, from a 0.025 kilometers uh, in Greenland per person to 34 kilometers. No, that's, that is incorrect. Uh, 34 kilometers uh, of... Uh, that doesn't, sorry, excuse me, I think those numbers have to be correct. The density in Greenland is much lower than the density in Faroe Island. Somehow I've messed that up. Uh, excuse me. Uh, they have similar economic adaptations among indigenous and rural populations, hunting, fishing, gathering, herding. Um, the statistics in Alaska, 44 million pounds of subsistence foods are consumed. 48% of the calories, approximately 516 pounds per person, um, in the state of Alaska for rural populations. So you can see there's a large um, amount of uh, nutrition in a large part of the economy, which comes from subsistence. And that is another characteristic that is, by and large, pan-Arctic. Uh, the Arctic is a very resource-rich place, uh, in natural resources, and there are similar colonial histories in the Arctic. And again, I'm just outlining some of the things are the reasons we talk about Arctic peoples as a group are these similarities. Um, the indigenous migration into the Arctic is prehistoric, settler populations, historic, exploration, exploitation, assimilation, colonization, missionization. I'll talk a little bit about those processes. Those have occurred pan-Arctic and look very similar. In my own research, it was one of the questions I had. Um, what does um, acculturation look like in Alaska? in a democracy and a capital economy versus in, at that time, the Soviet Union. Um, and actually, the process of colonization looks very similar on both sides of the Bering Straits, regardless of uh, the economic um, and political system. So those are some of the processes that are um, similar in the Arctic. So I want to talk a little bit about language. The Arctic is a very diverse place linguistically. You can see the map on the left in similar colors is our language relationships. Um, there are 90 different recorded languages, uh, either written or on tape. Uh, we know that there were obviously probably more than that, but uh, by the time people started recording languages, there were 90. There are 40 still spoken. 
and there is one that is not considered uh, or I should say we're using I'm using the old term here of endangered and indigenous people themselves prefer rightly so to talk about the language viability and the strongest uh, level of viability, the strongest language, fully um, fluent populations of young children uh, is green, the Greenlandic language, Kalachisut. All the other languages of the Arctic, languages like Yupik, Siberian Yupik, which when I started school we thought would never be endangered, has already become, uh, uh, the viability has dropped uh, dramatically just in the last, I hate to admit, 40 years. So. This is a, a very important, um, to all tribal peoples, indigenous people are concerned about their language and in the Arctic, uh, that language diversity is changing dramatically and there are efforts to try to revitalize in some places and keep strong uh, in others. So we applaud Greenland for all the work that they've done with language uh, to make sure that the language is strong. I give you this quote just because I love it. It's the um, complexity of language. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an entire ecosystem of spiritual possibilities. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind as we talk about uh, the Arctic and the changing Arctic. And language is one of the things that's a very important and key uh, to Arctic peoples and the long-term sustainability, since I titled this as sustainable. Um, these are just um, a few other things, a few other aspects of um, circumpolar Arctic peoples um, that I've already covered just a little bit. When they're, why are, how can we talk about Arctic peoples when their diversity is so great? And some of it is, as we talked about, the low population density. Um, I love that picture. Uh, similar economic adaptations, I'm repeating some of what I said, and uh, similar colonial histories. Um, this is indigenous hunting, obviously not the American whalers, but American whaling uh, was one of the processes. And a rapidly changing social and natural environment. Uh, this is a, a picture taken in the former Soviet Union obviously showing uh, uh, extractive industry development. Um, I always say we talk about uh, climate change in the Arctic, and climate change is obviously a very big driver of change, particularly now, or potential driver. But climate changing climate isn't the biggest thing to have happened to people in the Arctic. And um, these are just a few of the drivers, obviously the fur, industry, early colonial uh, colonization and early colonial history, uh, the American whalers on the right. Uh, other, other things, uh, the missionization of the Arctic. Uh, a lot of Arctic people uh, were Christianized. Alaska has a very uh, diverse and in some ways um, it's, it's certainly interesting. It certainly had a great effect. Um, turn of the century, the different churches actually decided how they would divide up the state of Alaska. And so you have communities where their language is strong because the missionaries uh, felt that it was important and they translated the Bible into native languages. In other areas, children were punished for speaking their native language uh, by uh, missionaries who were also educators. So those different processes created some of the patchwork, uh, but missionization was obviously a very strong force. Um, health, uh, the militarization of the Arctic following World War II, uh, the National Guard, has a strong history, certainly in the state of Alaska. On the other side, in Russia, um, there were a numerous bases built after World War II and during the Cold War, which brought in populations to the Arctic that previously, you know, were not indigenous in the Arctic. And so those are forces of change. Um, I talk about the two, two of the key drivers contemporarily today. Obviously, environmental changes. Uh, 
all of you who are interested in the Arctic are probably uh, well aware of the factors that are affecting local people, but also globalization, economic uh, and, uh, change, exposure, technology, those things are also um, elements of change uh, promotion today. Uh, okay. Um, I also really like this quote from the Arctic Human Development Report, 2004. So see, it's over 10 years, over a decade. They had another publication. It's a very, it's an excellent publication. Um, if you're interested in reading more about uh, Arctic sort of social science, social processes in the Arctic. Uh, Arctic societies have a well-deserved reputation for resilience in the face of change, but today they are facing unprecedented combination of rapid environmental change, cultural change, economic change, industrial development, political change, lang linguistic change as well. I think that's a really important. Uh, Arctic people actually were very adept at adapting to uh, environmental change. Um, and uh, its uh, political and social um, forces, if you've read Elizabeth Marino's Fierce Climate, Sacred Ground, she does, uh, it makes a very good argument that the, it's really not natural change that we're looking at, that uh, people are being affected by so carefully. Climate change is really a social process um, that's affecting people today. So in starting the um, Oh, another, I think another important thing that I, I wanted to briefly say, I'm looking at my notes here and you can read them too, um, really important to the long-term sustainability of Arctic communities uh, in the Arctic where the climate change signal is the strongest is uh, looking at uh, one of the groups through the Arctic Human Development Report, the Arctic Social Indicators, was looking at what are some of the social indicators for long-term sustainability. And working from the UN um, social indicators, they found that they weren't a good predictor uh, for well-being uh, and long-term sustainability in the Arctic. So working with um, uh, local people and researchers, they designed uh, three more indicators, which were fate control, which is obviously being able to guide one's own destiny, cultural integrity, which is the um, belonging to a local cultural group and being part of a social group, and contact with nature, closely interacting with the natural world, that if you added those into the UN indicators of, um, of social indicators of well-being, in communities which are primarily looking at educational success and economic um, success and and, uh, and and those types of indicators that in the Arctic if you added fake control cultural integrity and contact with nature you had a much better indicator uh, of the health and well-being of Arctic people which Arctic people actually have a strong sense of their own health and well-being um, Talking uh, about contact with nature, I want to play for you um, a piece that came out of the Bering Ecosystem Study because Perry Pangawi very eloquently talks about how important um, their connection to um, the natural environment is. And here he's particularly talking about ice. He is a Siberian Yupik from St. Lawrence Island who participated in this scientific work and has uh, gives a wonderful presentation about how important uh, ice is to uh, Yupik people. Ah, come on, I just re-embedded it. Uh, okay, so let me go. Sorry about this. I think it's worth taking the time to. Yeah, no, um, no worries. Yeah, we can maybe in the full this, view. Yeah. This small film because it's a really nice uh, film that I think everybody should see. Okay, let's see.
our culture will be threatened if we don't have ice, you know, it, it's all based around ice. We're taught to watch the ice, watch the current, wind direction, and everything evolves around the ice. Our way of life is very delicate. It's a very fragile ecosystem we're living in. One of our main diets is the walrus. Without the ice to support the walrus, and without the walrus to support our culture, it's a scary thought. I think it benefits both the scientists and us to come together and uh, share our own knowledge. You know, I've learned a lot from the scientists. I didn't think it was this serious, but when I'm talking with the scientists, they're, they're pretty sure of where it's headed. You know, it's, the ice is receding faster than they anticipated. And it's scary. It's worth caring about because we're all in the same boat, so to speak, you know. If something's wrong, everybody's going to be affected. I can't imagine living in a place without ice, and I can't imagine myself living anywhere else. Okay, I thought those were really important words. Um, <clears throat> I can't imagine living in a place without ice, and I can't imagine living anywhere else. One thing I'd like to add to what uh, Perry said is the Bering Ecosystem study is also about a decade old, and there's a lot more work that's going on First of all, a lot of uh, Alaska Native people and other indigenous people are becoming scientists themselves and are working more towards a model of co-production of knowledge between scientists and communities. And the program that I'm running has been uh, funding a lot of that type of research. Uh, so that indigenous scientists, indigenous scholars are working with communities and creating the questions that communities are interested in. Um, and a lot of non-indigenous scientists are also um, working on this model, what we're calling a co-production of knowledge or a more decolonized method of doing research rather than the scientist being the expert, uh, the non-indigenous Western trained scientists coming into a community. Um, collaborations are also good, but um, there's a lot, there's a, a strong need in the Arctic and in other places, but in particularly in the Arctic for co-producing knowledge uh, because uh, local communities, indigenous communities are so intimately knowledgeable about their uh, landscapes. So I just wanted to give uh, <clears throat> another example and I'm going to talk a lot about the relationship between people and animals uh, because in the Arctic that's a really key relationship. Um, it's probably one of the defining characteristics of indigenous peoples, the capital I, um, the relationship to the animals and the way in which they envision that relationship. This is a quote from George Amalek uh, in his Gift of the Whales. Um, and I think it's important, uh, you can read it, I don't need to read it to you, but basically where he says we've developed a kindred relationship with this great animal. We have a familiarity with the whale that no other people has. And so that's a really important perspective. And those, that, that perspective is um, pretty much pan-Arctic uh, in terms of relationships with reindeer, relationships with caribou, relationships with salmon, relationships with whales. Not each culture has that key relationship with each animal, but they do have relationships with all animals. It's just the Inupiaq 
uh, many of you are familiar, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, uh, that's a very important relationship, the bowhead whale. I, I, I just wanted to talk briefly about this because you may remember when the bowheads got caught, uh, trapped in the ice uh, in, at Point Barrow, which is almost two decades ago now. Um, and people uh, in the lower 48 who were watching this would say, well, why don't those people eat whale? Why don't they just kill them and eat them? And uh, when they were asking uh, one of the hunters on the North Slope in Barrow, why, why don't the people just process, you know, kill and process and eat these whales? And the answer was because the whales give themselves to us as uh, so that we may survive and and maintain ourselves as the Inupiaq people at this time we need to help them and so it was sort of a completely different um, understanding of a relationship with an animal and so indeed they brought in if you remember they brought in a big ice cutter and the um, they they created a pathway for the whales to be able to swim uh, to freedom. And so that, with the help of the Inupiaq people who viewed this as a symbiotic relationship. Um, I want to talk briefly about people that I've worked with, the Koryak and the Chukchi. Um, this is a picture of Koryak people, and they are reindeer herding people, and their relationship um, to the reindeer and to the environment is very strong. Um, they and other people in the Arctic have the same viewpoint, uh, obviously the Inupiaq, which we just talked about, uh, I talked about briefly, that animals are self-sacrificing. When, when an animal shows itself to you, it is giving itself to you, and you have a responsibility to uh, take the animal in a respectful manner. The woman on the right is pouring water on a reindeer that has been uh, taken for a, a, a ceremonial, um, a remembrance ceremony for someone who had passed away. And she's pouring water out of respect and to give the animal uh, a drink. On the right-hand side of my screen, maybe the left-hand side of yours, I'm not sure how this shows up, is a young boy who's being painted in the blood. And I asked the older woman, what does this mean? And she was rather astounded that I didn't know what it meant. And what it is is that the boy is becomes a reindeer. By painting him, they're painting the reindeer's mouth and eyes and hooves and horns. And at that moment, he is transformed into a reindeer. For the Koryak, um, reindeer are incarnated from fire. Human beings are incarnated from reindeer. And when a human being dies, traditionally prior to Soviet uh, rule, they were uh, cremated so they could go back to fire, completing this um, completing this cycle. So there's an important cycle. These relationships still exist uh, to this day. I like this picture. It's of a graveyard in uh, Barrow. These are the whale jawbones from the bowhead whale, the Christian cross on it. There is a syncretism in many places between uh, Christianity or other faiths and, um, and uh, indigenous uh, peoples. And this is just one representation of that. Uh, where I worked and lived among uh, the Yupik in uh, the Russian Far East, the whalebone was planted in memory of the whale itself. Um, that was part of the, the ideology. So I just wanted to show that, you know, uh, Christianity and uh, missionization had a lot of negative effects, but it was also accepted and has been um, embodied in traditional uh, forms. Um, this is Russian Orthodox. Now let's see if this one will, I can load this uh, URL. I like to show this because you're probably all familiar with the mine uh, at the headwaters of uh, the 
uh, the river um, that feeds into Bristol Bay, the largest salmon uh, spawning grounds. And, um, and that particular mine, this was uh, a ceremony surrounding water because water is key. And again, you see how Russian Orthodoxy and local understandings and visions of not just the salmon, this is among the Yupik people of the lower Kuskokwim, but also water itself uh, is a critical symbol. Let's see if I can get this to, oh, how nice. So we can play this. I think this is a nice um, video, if it loads, that expresses that relationship uh, for between water. Water is also very important in the Orthodox tradition. We all know, maybe we don't all know, but Christianity, obviously, water purity. Uh, let's see if this will play. sacred, it's given to us by God, and it is essential for life. Our communion with God in this world depends on the world itself being clean and pure and held in sacred trust. water didst drown sin in the days of Noah. Thou art a God who by the sea through Moses didst free from slavery to Pharaoh the Hebrew race. In sanctifying the waters, we're sanctifying one of the most basic elements for life in the universe. As far as we know, there is no life without water. And at this time, when part of my flock is threatened by the proposed building of the Pebble Mine, we've come out here to remind them and remind others of how important the water is for their survival. We are here in southwestern Alaska to make a statement uh, of solidarity with the native Alaskan people here, that the church, that God, we believe, um, affirms their inherent right to live in this region as they have for more than 10,000 years. Do thou thyself, O Master, sanctify even now this water by thy Holy Spirit. Do thou thyself, O Master, sanctify even now this water by thy Holy Spirit. Do thou thyself, O Master, sanctify even now this water by thy Holy Spirit. Grant unto all who touch it, anoint themselves therewith and partake of sanctification, blessing, cleansing, and health. And all is the Lord's heart, and the Spirit, in the form of a dove, confirm the truth from the of His word. O Christ, our God, who has revealed Thyself, and has enlightened the world, glory to Thee. When the there are
are sins against human beings. There are also sins against nature. There are human actions that should not be undertaken because they will defile or desecrate the land itself, which is held in sacred trust from one generation to the next. We want to remind the people here that their choices that they make today are going to affect their children and their children's children and a way of life and culture that's been here in Alaska for 10,000 years. Anna, just very quickly from my end, uh, it's twelve forty one at this point. Yeah, so if, if you, if you want to maybe take five more minutes and then we have some time for discussion. Sounds good. Excellent. Okay, I will, I was just going to look at the time, so I'm going to pass by my whole discussion about language, uh, only to say that you always hear uh, Inuit people have 300 words plus for snow, actually it's ice. Uh, as we learned from Caleb, where there are many, many words and is very important, um, way beyond, I scientists have been working with the Nupiak Yupik people to be able to understand the different aspects of ice that, that uh, local people understand. This particular, I just wanted to very quickly say, this is talking a little bit about, in Canada, they call subsistence foods, country foods versus store-bought foods. And I just wanted to show you these pictures because it is a visual representation of networks of sharing. And you can see the complexity of how subsistence foods, country foods are shared in the top slide. And the lack or lesser complexity, the big note at the middle is uh, a uh, food, um, a warehouse where people can get food uh, for free. Um, so as the environment changes, if one were to say people should move more towards a store-bought food, you can see how social uh, aspects of the way our, our rural communities are um, organized would change dramatically because food sharing is a huge part of uh, the social organization. I'm going to pass on migration. I'll pass on talking about industrial activities. This just shows the routes, shipping routes in the Bering Sea vis-a-vis -vis current uh, hunting activities. Um, I mentioned briefly technological changes. Uh, as, a, as I said, it's not just climate change. Uh, technological changes are having a huge effect and will continue to have a huge effect. Uh, the challenges and the opportunities, as they like to say, what uh, access to these technologies um, in a lot of places, like in many areas of the world, rural communities in the Arctic are leapfrogging over connectivity lines and moving towards cellular uh, connectivity. Again, here is uh, the climate is changing. Obviously, we can't ignore the fact that the climate is changing. It's going to have a lot of uh, uh, impact on local people, much of what you've heard about. And the last thing I'll do is I want to show you uh, Anenet's reindeer as I close off and end, and I'll put myself back on. Um, this is the way Anenet's people today, uh, who are reindeer herders, travel across the tundra. And you can see as the tundra permafrost melts, it's affecting their migration, which, which is having a lot of effects. Uh, okay, I'm going to end the show. Sorry for moving a little slowly. And move out and put my own face back on and I'll end share screening. Okay. Excellent. Am I good? Oh, absolutely. Thank, Sorry, thank I had you to so live. much, Anna. I'm too verbose. Thank you. No, no, this was excellent and it was all very, very interesting and you covered a lot of topics and obviously, I mean, we talked a little bit in the preparation. It's of course a huge challenge to put a lot of information in this short time frame. So, 
I'm, I'm very glad that you gave us this run through and I hope that you'll be also available later on after the session for maybe follow up questions. But right now we can open the Q&A. We have a few minutes and I think, um, I mean, you, you, of course, you talked about the diversity, the differences, but also similarities. Uh, very, very interesting to see uh, how multifaceted this is. But you also talked about research uh, itself changing, moving from this traditional way of research to co-creation and, and, and more participatory approaches in research. Very exciting. Uh, and, and I definitely think this also pertains or is relevant for, for uh, people here in the group. Uh, we had already one question come in from Bern, and I don't know, Bern, if we can, um, if you can ask your question uh, yourself, if your audio works for that, otherwise I'll be happy to read it, but your microphone is open. Yeah, we can't really hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. No. I didn't know if it was a technical issue with my computer. My laptop is eight years old. <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead and speak. Just let me know if you have issues hearing me. No, we could. Uh, okay. So um, yeah, I, I really appreciated this presentation. And one of the things that I've thought about um, in regards to the Arctic for a long time is just how how can uh, we better describe, quantify the importance of the Arctic ice to the indigenous peoples of the Arctic? Because, um, you know, it's, it's a fundamental part of the ecosystem and a fundamental part of the daily lives of, of the people there. And one thing I've been fascinated by was if there's ever been any study that has tried to quantify um, in an economic sense, the value of the ice in the Arctic to the uh, to the Arctic itself as well as to the to the planet as a whole. And I asked that question because something that's developed recently in environmental policy community is the whole idea of uh, ecosystem services and how do you how do you quantify the value of of of, a, of an element of an ecosystem to the local community. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, I did actually hear it. Um, it's a really good question, and the first thing I'll say to answer is there's a really nice article that was recently published by Matt Sturm and Michael Goldstein and Henry Huntington where they looked at ice roads. Um, you can get it on the web. I think it's called the Black Shoals, which is an economic model for being able to calculate um, uh, future investment value and Michael Goldstein had a very innovative idea to apply that to what you're talking about ecosystem services I'm not a big fan I'm an anthropologist I'm an ethnologist I prefer qualitative understanding so that people themselves can explain why this is important but I understand um, also, the value of quantitative and uh, Michael Goldstein, if you can't find that article, you can find me at NSF and I'd be happy to send it to you. He's at Babson College. I think Matt Sturm, because the actual research project, Matt was the PI, I think he's the first author, but I'm not positive. And Michael is moving forward with that work. He's done some of that work to be able to calculate the value of the snow cap in the Sierra Nevada. And he's moving on into working with other Arctic economists, but that's very preliminary. Interesting stuff, no question. It's very difficult to create a quantitative value to subsistence resources. I mean, we can get kilocalories, but it doesn't begin to uh, quantify how people feel and how they think and their whole epistemology around subsistence. And ice is exactly the same. How do you quantify? Um, the value of ice to a walrus hunter. It's a complex issue, so I think it has to be a combination of both. Um, if the system and policy makers want to know what is that dollar number, um, Michael is working on a process for being able to give you that, but I think the story behind and the, all of the cultural, social, linguistic data is also very important. 
Yeah, and I think there is, of course, always the risk if we only follow um, uh, an economic valuation approach that maybe the value is relatively low in the end. And that can, of course, backfire quite a bit. Yeah, it's like asking someone, how do you make the economic value of taking the sacrament to a devout Catholic? Right. What's the economic value? It's, uh, it's an impossible. You have to have a full picture of, of both the qualitative understanding and the quantitative understanding. And even then, sometimes it's difficult for people from different cultures, different epistemologies to understand and, and reconcile the two. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Andreas Kramer. And if you want to, if your microphone is uh, working, you can go ahead and ask it. I guess it's working, and I see you nodding. Um, now, first of all, thank you very much. I enjoyed this very much. I, I come from the water sphere. I know more about water than about ice. Um, so I enjoyed the references to water and its uh, place in um, uh, society and its spiritual value. I do have a question concerning the co-production of knowledge by scientists, which are southern trained, um, western trained, whatever you want to call it and local people. Um, our understanding in, in Germany and in other industrialized countries is that co-production happens between people who have a scientific career, who are the scientists, and the practitioners who have some basic scientific training. Many of them have a university degree, but even if they don't, they had some scientific uh, education at school. Um, I guess that the um, interface it looks different in the Arctic when you talk about indigenous peoples who have not gone um, to this, but they have another type of uh, heuristic scientific knowledge. They understand the ice, they understand the earth dynamics uh, in their place much better than the people who don't live there, but they may not have the, the analytical concept. So how does this work and has somebody done a study of this? Is there, is, are there writings on the practice of this co-production now that one could use to compare it to the practice that we have in our industrialized countries? Yeah, it's it, that's an excellent question and I would have to say methodologies are being worked out and I funded several projects and Andreas I'm happy to you know give you abstracts and give you articles but the obviously it's complex because exactly what you described you're sometimes dealing with two different epistemologies and there's several different levels of co-production of knowledge one is where the community itself has questions uh, about the processes and we have a wonderful project at the University of Alaska on permafrost and I convinced uh, the community came to me and said our elders want to know about permafrost and what's happening in permafrost and how it's going to affect us they went to the scientists I said you know since it's permafrost you're interested not in the social processes the physical processes find yourselves a couple scientists at the University of Alaska a lot of great permafrost scientists there Santosh Panda and and Sasha Alexander Kaladov, you gotta love the name, it means cold, and he's a permafrost scientist. Um, and they've been working with the community, and I asked them recently, and Sasha gave a great presentation at HEU, the Geophysical Union meetings last year. And I asked them, okay, they said, wow, you know, we learned so much about permafrost itself and how the community uses the environment and how permafrost is so important to them. And I said to them, you know, the community chose the spots where their permafrost monitoring devices would go. And I said to them, what about your own, you know, your fairly early career? What about your own scientific publications? And how do you feel, you know, that process is going in this co-production model where actually the community itself set the questions and came to the scientists. And they said, it's great. We're actually getting better scientific quantitative scientific data because of having worked and listened to the community members. So I thought that was great. Again, we're still looking at Western scientific knowledge. When you're trying to blend two epistemologies, I think the very basic, which is what decolonizing models in science is about, is you come to it out of respect. And Lena Kielsen Holm in Greenland has given marvelous paper and many indigenous people are actually becoming academically trained scientists. And so there's a lot of new options. Um, there's even a movement toward what's called research, um, research sovereignty, which is indigenous people 
becoming scientists and answering questions that their communities have because they very well know that the Arctic will not always be the hot scientific place to do research and a lot of Western non-indigenous scientists are going to go home and indigenous people will still be left with many, many questions that may not be interesting to say you, Andreas. And so there's a whole movement towards sovereignty to get more of their own community members trained and educated and able to ask quantitative questions as well as do qualitative research. Thank so it's you. not a perfect answer, it's a work in progress, but I can give you a number of articles and point you in the direction. Feel free to send me an email. I'm going on annual leave tomorrow, so I would say send Be it quick. to me towards the end of August, so it's at the top of my mailbox instead of the yeah, okay. bottom of my mailbox. I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, I, I hope that we will have the possibility of putting the literature list together for the benefit of everybody um, who is in the Arctic Summer College. That's the idea of sharing. Fantastic. It's a great idea. And I think uh, Lena Kilston Holmes' article on knowledge co production is on the web. You can probably find it. If it's not, I've got a copy and I'll send it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, let me maybe follow up on this uh, aspect because you, you worked for the National Science Foundation. So, in how far does this new approach to research and producing research knowledge? And how far do you try to also um, push this or foster it in within your organization? Yeah, it's in my solicitation. And um, I've been pushing for the last 15 years for natural scientists to do more. And I think if you go to Arctic Literature, you'll find out there is a lot more um, working with communities, collaborating with communities, more sort of what we call a participatory model. Um, not all scientists probably should be talking to communities. Some people are really great at what they do and they're not great at social relationships. So that's probably not a good model for them. And other people are great at social relationships and then are, can be, you know, go-betweens. But ultimately, I think even for natural scientists, you're missing key data and key understandings, not just, you know, epistemologies, Western epistemologies or, you know, academic epistemologies, scientific and, and indigenous epistemologies. I'm not into indigenous people's knowledge and service to science. I think we need a model where people are co-producing, working together from the get-go, asking questions together, gathering data together, analyzing data together, and producing and publishing or creating uh, materials for communities together. It is not the dominant model in the natural and physical sciences. It has been a strong model in the social sciences for some time, in particular in the Arctic. But I think that that's the reason I asked that question of Santosh and uh, Sasha, because I think it's important that scientists not only can learn themselves, but they can actually get better data as a result of working closely. Communities have questions that you haven't even thought of. I mean, it, the Yupik community on St. Lawrence Island has 92 words for ice, and scientists do not recognize, and they are definitely um, scientifically measurable differences between those 92 different forms of ice. And um, that's not recognized, and wow, that could be really important for understanding ice. Thank Sorry. you. No, thank you very much, Anna. Um, we are almost at the end of the hour, but I wanted to ask you, you said already you're going on annual leave tomorrow, so there's some break time. But for you personally, what's your, um, what are your future or current ongoing research projects? What, what areas do you work on and what will you work on in the near future? Do you know something that you can share with us? I'm fantasizing right now. I live vicariously through all of you, the research community. And so I've been working very hard to build this program and to help and support particularly indigenous scholarship. Um, I look back at my own research from years ago working in the Soviet Union and it wasn't a co-production model at all. And so now it creates some angst for me, but I guess that's good. We all learn. My fantasy is that they will give me a sabbatical and I will be able to work in Mexico with some of the indigenous communities in Mexico 
um, that uh, looking at how climate has caused situation where migration is uh, most, there's communities where entire uh, communities of primarily women, children, and older people, because all the men who are possibly of working age can come to the north. I'm fascinated by that relationship between how climate is affecting uh, labor migration and uh, what those communities look like and, and what's happening today and bringing a more co-production model for research with indigenous communities in uh, the central part of Mexico. Um, completely getting out of the Arctic but informed by the Arctic, it's just because you know, the Arctic, it takes a long time to get there. It's difficult to get there. It's expensive. And I'm fascinated by this idea that climate, immigration policy, all these things are affecting these uh, small communities in Mexico. So keep your fingers crossed that they, that they send me out uh, once again, and particularly a co-production model. Um, very few Mexicans have a co-production model of um, working with communities and designing projects. I'm very interested in that. Well, excellent. And it's exciting to see that your interests go even beyond the Arctic. Of course, uh, we, we thank you so much for sharing your, your uh, knowledge, your past research results, and in, in also your, uh, your, um, the videos you showed. They were really impressive. I um, want to invite you to stay on. If you have time, you can stay on and listen to our next presentation. But of course, I understand it's the last day before your vacation, so usually there's a lot happening. So in case you can't stay on, I say already thank you and goodbye and enjoy your vacation. We'll stay in touch. And as Andrea said already, we'll also uh, be interested in some of the literature. And uh, well, thank you again. And um, let's hope to see, I hope to see you sometime soon. And now I will um, introduce our next speaker. Let and, me say um, one quick thing. Yes, yes. I just want to course. say, I'm sorry, Inatuk, I would love to hear your talk, but Simon has made me promise I will come to staff meeting, which is at one o'clock. So uh, I am unfortunately going to have to step off, but thank you very much for this opportunity. And feel free, my email is on the web or share it broadly. I'm happy to answer any questions um, and look forward to talking to each of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, with that, so Inotech, you've been already halfway introduced several times. I'll try to do this uh, one more time formally. So um, thank you very much for joining us now for the second presentation today, Inotech Holm Olsen. And uh, I will probably stumble over your official title, Minister Plenipotentiary for Greenland at the Royal Danish Embassy in Washington, D.C. In my own words, I hope this is more or less accurate. You're the head of the representation at the Greenland representation at the Danish Embassy in Washington, D.C., so the highest ranking representative of Greenland in the United States and also accredited for Canada, if I've seen this correctly. So thank you very much for joining us and please uh, feel free to correct me in, in, in this rendering of your position. I'm really grateful for you taking time to join us here today. And I see you already share your screen so and your camera is on as well. So the floor is yours and thank you for taking time for the Arctic Summer College today. No, thank you very much. I think you pronounced uh, everything very well. Uh, also, thank you to Anna uh, for her presentation. And um, I listened to it uh, very, I mean, it was a very interesting presentation. And uh, I'm going to go, I mean, um, since I represent Greenland um, in the US as well as Canada, as you said, you know, my focus is basically uh, Greenland. And because I'm a, I mean, um, I'm a government employee and I have been, um, uh, I mean, an official of the government of Greenland for now as 20 plus years and um, especially working in the field of foreign affairs you know, all these years. So um, I was um, had the privilege to be the first representative uh, uh, here in the US. Um, 
And I've been here since 2014, where Greenland opened a representation. Um, and um, we have, I mean, we have had a representation in Brussels because of our relations with the EU, and also because of our, you know, we are actually the first country that uh, exited um, the EU in 1985. So we have had a representation there in. Um, since '92, and I also been posted there. So uh, my, I have a very, very uh, background in terms of uh, the different fields as well as um, uh, positions. But I've been all, all, always engaged in, you know, Arctic matters because of Greenland's position uh, in the Arctic, and also with Greenland politics or political development. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm going to be focused on um, in my presentation. Um, as been as it been said, you know, especially uh, by Anna. I mean, Greenland was a colony of Denmark for for many many years. And what we've been engaged in, uh, or if you look at it, you know, from a macro perspective, uh, in the last thirty plus years, is that we've been it's been a process of decolonization, um, both politically and as well as economically, uh, but also, I mean, culturally, educationally, and in terms of you know many different uh, aspects. So basically, we we gained home, uh, what is called home rule in 1979, um, which is when we began the uh, the establishment of our political institutions. I mean, there was a I mean, a, um, consultative uh, uh, political bodies before that, uh, but uh, but I mean, with the 79 Home Rule Act, uh, you know we we created, so to speak, a real parliament, you know, a real government, and began the process of taking over other responsibilities from Denmark. And throughout the years, you know, we've, we've been adding uh, um, sector by sector, area by area. So we have a large degree of autonomy now, uh, which uh, also led to a, a demand for a new relationship and a more modernized home rule, uh, which uh, I was part of. I was I had the privilege of being part of a, um, the self rule commission, uh, and in their dealings with you know with Greenland's foreign, foreign affairs, and um, and the, there's actually a chapter in the self rule act that deals with Greenland's uh, um, you know foreign affairs. Uh, uh, rights and responsibilities and you know obligations. Um, so with the and that came into effect in two thousand nine. Which and so it's a more modernized version of uh, um, a so called uh, two point uh, version of the Home Rule Act. And in the, in that act, I mean there are some very you know also important aspects. I think which. Uh, should be kept in mind uh, when we talk about uh, greenness, political and economic development. One, uh, um, and I mentioned, you know, the linguistic issue. Green, um, Greenland uh, is uh, now officially the, uh, I mean, the official language in Greenland. In the Home Rule Act, it was both Greenlandic and Danish, but uh, with the Home Rule Act, that was specified to be only Greenlandic. Uh, because actually, and in this case, we have uh, a German to be thankful for because it was actually a German missionary who developed the written Greenlandic written system uh, many years ago, and uh, I mean several centuries ago. And also, um, I think the fact that we have had a newspaper since 1861, you know, is also part of this uh, kind of a. Um, Self perception of self recognition as as a distinct people and you know literature it is is an important part of that kind of uh, development uh, as a people uh, decides you know uh, because it connects you know the country together uh, when you can have you know share the same like uh, you know newspapers and books and and other cultural um, instruments. Um, but going back to the two, 2009 Act, um, in that there's also a, um, a chapter that deals with secession, uh, which means that you know it will be up to the people of Greenland to, to decide um, on the on the issue of independence. Um, 
I mean, you could see, you could see this process since '79 as a one long process of you know of uh, secession, so to speak, because uh, we want to be. I mean, what, what I mean. The, the demand for this, you know, that started in the 70s was that, uh, that discontent with being um, um, remotely controlled from Copenhagen. So, uh, and in that is that is the belief that, you know, uh, decisions that affect the people of Greenland and the Greenlanders, you know, should be taken by, you know, um, by the people themselves through, you know, the different political bodies, you know, through the parliament, through the government, as well as the municipalities. Uh, so it's been, um, so, and the Self-Rule Act of 2009, um, I mean, states that, you know, eventually it will be up to the people of Greenland to decide in a referendum uh, what kind of, uh, you know, whether Greenland should secede from Denmark. Uh, and, and one of the things that we are, you know, beginning to uh, pounder is, you know, what kind, um, what kind of relationship we should have uh, as we become more and more independent, and that will will continue, you know, in the in the coming uh, years. And it's not not so much about, you know, an issue of, you know, or, you know we have to, we should. Uh, Become independent in such in such a year, but it's more uh, the process itself because I mean we still have some ways to go, and especially in terms of economic um, self sufficiency, I mean we still are dependent on Denmark in terms of that uh, because we receive uh, around six hundred fifty million uh, U.S. dollars a year. So uh, part of this political uh, you know. Um, process is also has also something to do with the economic economics. So that's what we are. Uh, I mean, also focused on is to become what's more um, economically self-sufficient, uh, and that's where we are trying to develop the, the different sectors. Um, but fisheries is still, you know, the most. Uh, um, important economic uh, sector in Greenland, with, and it accounts for uh, more than 90% of our exports. But we are also aware that Greenland is very well um, endowed when it comes to minerals. Uh, we have some, um, um, you know, both highly graded, but also in terms of quality, a lot of different minerals which are becoming important. You know, you know, in this kind of globalized world. Especially when it comes to you know um, renewable energy, where a lot of them are dependent on, uh, for example, rare earth uh, elements and minerals uh, that we that we have a lot of, and because actually, I mean, two of the world's largest known deposits of rare earths are, are in the South Greenland and are being um, they're not mined, but they are, uh, I mean, companies that are uh, developing and um, developing these uh, new. These projects, in terms of, I mean, it, it, um, it's it, it's something that we have um, developed in terms of the uh, legal regimes, you know, in, in institutions over the last twenty plus years. Uh, I mean, when I talk about the mineral sector, so it's we're just beginning to see the fruition of that of that uh, work and that labor. Uh, because uh, it's now that we are beginning to see mines uh, opening up. There's a small um, rubies and sapphires mine that's just opened uh, not too long ago, uh, which is close to Nuuk. Um, and maybe I, I have a I have a map that I would like to uh, be uh, that I like to yeah show. I don't know. If, is is it showing or what? Yes, it is. Because I think it's um, um, it's always a good thing. So um, there's a rubies and sapphires mine that just opened up at just south of Nuuk, and then there was a, um, another small smaller mine that, uh, uh, that's will open up next year. It's it's, it's a mineral called anorthosite. Uh, it's a mineral used in the production of fiberglass, and which is a um, 
Um, I mean, the, my result is just going to be very, it's going to be small, smaller, but uh, according to the company, I mean, they have enough for, for, to be in production for like 100 uh, years or something. And the, and the two uh, large deposits of rare earth are close to NASA and up on top here in the uh, southern part of Greenland. And then um, there was another uh, mining project that uh, just got its uh, license a couple of months ago it's uh, for lead and sink in northeast greenland uh, and uh, that's uh, also going to be a, a big uh, operation when it um, uh, when it's opening up but i think it's uh, th they're looking for financing uh, as of, as we speak now so in terms of you know um, the um, Near the future, I mean, that's where we are seeing developments in terms of a, a new sector. But tourism is also another uh, sector that we are beginning to uh, see increased numbers of. Um, it's, it's a new industry, so uh, relatively speaking, uh, when we speak uh, of tourism in Greenland, but, um, and it's been something that we have developed as well, you know, in the last 20 plus years. And now, I mean, uh, if you look at, the, for example, the numbers of tourists that are going to Iceland, I mean, they have uh, gone from like a quarter of a million to over two million this year in a relatively short number of years. I mean, we're not going to see those kind of numbers uh, because Greenland uh, doesn't have the infrastructure in terms of, you know, um, taking in uh, mass tourism. But I think we get around 60,000 tourists a year and that can actually, uh, there's room for growth and in, and we are dependent on, you know, uh, infrastructure development in that, uh, in that case because uh, our, for example, airport infrastructure, when it comes to, uh, for example, um, uh, international airports, we are dependent on the, <laughs> um, on the infrastructure that the Americans built during, uh, just after World War II, for example, you know they had a base in Gangastusua, which is just about the Arctic Circle, uh, which is our main kind of a hub for uh, um, last planes, um, and then there's one in Nastasua in South Greenland as well. I mean, th these are two you know former U.S. bases uh, that we are so, so far still relying on when it comes to airport infrastructure. Of course, the runways on the coast, you know, all around the coast uh, are too short to, to be able to take on lots of planes. But that's going to change now because uh, uh, Nuke and Iluliset, um, um, Nuke the capital and then the Iluliset, you know, in the Disco Bay, uh, um, are going to have uh, new runways that are going to be uh, transformed the, um, I mean, the airport infrastructure radically uh, in the next couple of years. You know, from when they are completed, I mean, they will be able to take on, you know, direct uh, flights from um, both from Europe but also North America. Uh, and that's, those are needed, you know, we need, you know, much, uh, more infrastructure like those um, if we talk about, you know, continue develop, uh, developing the economic sector uh, as well as, um, uh, I mean, for example, I mean, tourism uh, sector as well. Um, because, you know, you'll skip this, you know, um, this hub that you have to take from Gans to Swap, where nobody lives, you know, to, or to the different destinations. Um, cruise tourism is also something that um, we have, seen a growth in, I mean, there was a growth up until I think 2008 or nine, and then uh, that dropped because of the worldwide economic, you know, uh, slow, uh, I mean, um, recession. But those numbers are also coming back and, you know, um, and the opening up, of, for example, of the Northwest Passage to uh, shipping, I mean, creates, uh, I mean, I mean uh, we have seen the, um, the last, um, I can't remember the name of the uh, last uh, cruise ship that went on last year, but we're also going to do this uh, this year. I mean, they're, I mean, they're stopping at several places uh, on, 
on the west coast. So we are on the rule, you know, um, for the, those kind of ships uh, when it comes to the uh, Northwest Passage. Um, and um, because of our internal, you know, we have a, I mean, shipping system internally already in place. Uh, um, because, um, I mean, we have deep water ports all around uh, Greenland in the, in the majority of the towns. So, um, and we're building a whole new kind of port facility in the, in the capital of Nuuk, uh, which will take on, will be, which will be able to take on much, you know, uh, uh, much bigger ships. Uh, but that, and that's not because of, you know, the, future prospects of shipping in the Arctic, but that's only because of you know, domestic demands. So in terms of, you know, um, our, uh, I mean, future, I mean, we are going to see a continued, you know, uh, focus on both uh, taking over areas of responsibility from uh, Copenhagen uh, to Greenland. Um, one of the, uh, Issue, uh, sectors that we are looking into is to take over, for example, the uh, area of the foreign labor and immigration. Um, and then we are also looking into um, air traffic uh, um, control, as well as, um, I mean, there, there's a number of working groups that are looking into different uh, sectors because uh, as opposed to the Self uh, Home Rule Act uh, from 79, you know, we have to pay for uh, to take over these new areas uh, because in the Home Rule Act, you know, we were paid whenever we took over a new uh, sector. Uh, money followed from Copenhagen, but, but that's not the case uh, as part of the agreement from 2009. So we have to finance those ourselves you know, from now on. And, but uh, one of the first sectors that we, that we took over with the 2009 Act was the area of mineral resources. Well, that's, I mean, the connection, you know, to the land it is something that we hold dear, very dear um, uh, as a people in Greenland. Also because of, uh, of the fact that there's no private ownership of land in Greenland. It's all public. It's all in the hands of, you know, uh, the municipalities as well as the government. So, um, so we have a different kind of relationship to, to, to the land. Uh, as opposed to uh, you know the rest of the world, so to speak, since there's no um, private ownership of land. Um, so, um, so as I said, you know, economics and, uh, and uh, the policy is closely tied to each other. Um, so um, that's what we're going to be focused on. But we're not, as I said, you know, we, it's, it's not a question about you know that um, we should be. Uh, uh, that we should become self-sufficient uh, economically as well as, as well as politically in a number of years. It, it, it's, it will still be a long-term process, uh, so to speak. Um, but nevertheless, I think you know we have set our sight, uh, we have set our goal in sight, and that's uh, that's what we're going to focus on. Um, and in that respect, you know, we, we are looking into. Um, uh, diversifying our international relations as well, you know, because for many years, you know, we were only looking uh, to uh, Copenhagen uh, uh, and was much more dependent on that. But now, you know, we, with, the, um, with a much more globalized world that has also reached, you know, the Arctic, um, we are, we are going to see, you know, a much more internationally oriented uh, agreement uh, as opposed to a something that was very isolated, um, uh, you know, in previously and historically. Um, but, um, um, I mean, you know, being in the Arctic, I mean, being located in the Arctic, it's not easy also because, you know, our uh, population density is, is not that great. Uh, uh, we are um, in Asia, a people of uh, only 56,000. But we're not, so to speak, um, deterred by you know our low numbers because I mean we will always be dependent to some degree on you know um, on foreign labor uh, and and specialists and you know that's going to continue in the coming years. 
but uh, uh, you know, a part of this process uh, has, has, as Anna also was uh, mentioning, is you know the continued development of educational infrastructure, which was uh, basically non-existent, you know, prior to '79. So we've been engaged, you know, in, in building up our uh, educational infrastructure in terms of, you know, building up a university and different colleges and uh, enabling, you know, Greenlanders to take on uh, different um, educational uh, educations uh, um, in Greenland as opposed to, you know, um, ha having had to um, go to Denmark for further education um, in, in the past. So, um, so it's it's a multitude of um, of uh, of set of you know of capacity buildings that we have been engaged in. Uh, so it's basically kind of a nation building exercise in that respect. Uh, so and that's going to continue. You know, uh, you know we are looking into you know uh, research as a. Um, um, I mean. Of building up, you know, continuing to build up our research, uh, our research infrastructure, infrastructure, and research institutions uh, uh, in that regard. So, um, and I mean, those things will continue uh, because um, I mean, we see uh, an empowerment through education as a as a vital uh, tool, you know, in, in terms of um, both. Uh, reaching the political as well as the economic goals uh, in the in the long um, I mean in a longer uh, period of time. Um, so, um, but I think maybe um, I'll stop at that. I mean, I could go into many different areas, um, in, um, but um, I rather have you know an interaction uh, with with this, I mean with you uh, with the audience. Uh, and with the different questions that you might have. And also, I mean, it could be um, about something that I have, haven't mentioned, but that you you know, that you are curious to hear more about. Uh, and so I'll try to answer that uh, to the best of my abilities. Well, thank you very, very much, Inutek. This was extremely fascinating for me, uh, not knowing that much, uh, not having known that much about Greenland. Of course, you're right. There's a lot of questions, and I hope we uh, can ask some of these now in the remaining time. I um, I think it's, it's it's fascinating when you say that your uh, your model is a long-term nation building, a long-term. Uh, you call this secession at some point, or, or a road to independence, but there's no set date. I think it's very fascinating also in the bigger picture, looking at other uh, countries uh, or territories also moving into independence. And of course, this has been a process since, well, uh, at, at least um, happening massively since World War II around the world. And uh, I, I'm, I'm personally very curious to know, um, not knowing this now, what's your relationship uh, to the European Union? Because you're, uh, I know you talked about your relationship with Denmark, but is uh, what's your status towards the European Union, and how would this also change possibly through this process? Do you yeah. have something? Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Thank you for asking asking that because uh, um, you know the thing about um, the political movement in the seventies uh, that led to the Home Rule was also uh, partly due to Denmark's membership of the then you know was called the European Economic Community. Uh, now we call it the EU. So I'll call, you know, I'll call it the EU uh, since it's easier. Uh, because in 1972, Denmark joined the uh, EU, uh, and in that uh, regard, there was also a referendum in Greenland, and even though 70, more than 70 percent of the people voted against uh, membership, we were forced to kind of uh, become part of that uh, uh, union. Um, um, since you know our votes are only uh, so few compared to the Danish ones. So, um, so the, I mean, that was also part of the equation uh, in this movement, uh, because fisheries 
you know, being our most, uh, the biggest industry agreement uh, was now, you know, controlled by, uh, from Brussels. And we didn't want that. I mean, we didn't, we wanted to develop our own, you know, industry in that, in that sense. Uh, so, I mean, we took up the issue of continued membership in 82 in a referendum and where a majority of, the, of them you know, voted um, against continued membership. So that was achieved in 85. And then, you know, we have entered into a fisheries agreement with the EU, uh, which means that, you know, we, we, we got uh, the same amount of money that we had received when we were members, um, as opposed to, you know, uh, you know we gave uh, some rights to, uh, to um, EU vessels to fish in our waters. And that's still in existence today. But that has been modernized. So we have now a, a partnership agreement as well, where e, the EU um, gives funds to some to our educational sector to develop that uh, sector as well. So, but in short, I mean, I, I think our relations with the EU are much uh, are very. I mean, we very we are content with our um, relations uh, with the EU. Uh, but I mean, but every now and then, you know, there will be a political party in Greenland that take that says, "Oh, why don't we become members of the EU again?" You know, uh, you know we will get all these. Uh, we need all this, you know, infrastructure development, you know, and what have you. And the EU will be um, helpful in that regard uh, because you know it is limited what uh, um, what we can do with the EU because we are not part of it. But uh, but as part of the agreement, uh, um, we, I mean, we, we gained status as an, a so-called overseas country and territory. It's a, a council decision that deals with, you know, former colonies of EU member states uh, that are still not independent, uh, but, uh, but still have some um, constitutional relations with an EU member state. Those are, I mean, Britain had a number, has a number of them, and now that you know they'll be gone in a number of years. France has some, you know, with the French Polynesia and New Caledonia and uh, in, um, some in the Caribbean, and the Dutch also have, you know, Aruba and um, the Netherlands and Tilly's. And so, um, so in that sense, you know, we have. Um, um, free market access for our products, uh, for example, for our fisheries products, but that's being eroded uh, I mean, because now the EU has entered into a free trade agreement with Canada, for example, and Canada is our biggest competitor when it comes to uh, you know, uh, fisheries export to the EU. So, um, um, so even though you know we, are, uh, I think overall we are content with our uh, relations. Uh, we, we also see, I mean, there's also a, a, a development in terms of other um, um, issues, for example, free trade agreement that are, you know, uh, kind of uh, not as uh, worthwhile as they have been in the past, you know, so, uh, but it will be interesting to see, you know, in the future, what kind of, uh, you know, relations we will have with the European Union. Um, and, um, but, uh, for now, I think it's uh, it, they're good. Excellent, thank you, thank you for that um, answer, Inotek. And I have several questions from our participants, and I'll see if uh, David, if you can ask your question personally. I have unmuted you. If your microphone works, you can speak now. Otherwise, I'll try to rephrase it. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes we do. Uh, okay, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. And I have a question uh, related to the level of participation of native uh, or indigenous communities into policy decisions. Uh, for, ex for example, um, when uh, a company or a government see an op uh, identify an opportunity, commercial opportunity or industrial development or whatever, uh, in which uh, level are the native communities uh, considered uh, mm. when taking the decision of this development? Or yeah, 
Um, yeah, a very good question. I mean, Greenland is, uh, um, I mean, we have a public um, government, which means that um, it's not an indigenous uh, government as such, you know, or defined as such. But if you um, saw Anna's uh, presentation, the uh, population uh, uh, setup, I think, um, I think it's 70, no, no, it's 88%, I think, uh, of the population in Greenland that's uh, uh, defined as Greenlanders or Inuit, you know, um, while 12% are, um, they're mostly from Denmark, but that's also, uh, you know, um, other, other, um, from other na nations. So basically, I mean, we are an Inuit nation, even though, you know, it, um, the, um, we part of the kingdom of Denmark and we are Danish citizens uh, as such. Um, so, um, and when it comes to uh, the economic development, for example, in the mineral, in the mining sector, um, one, I mean, one key to success is the involvement of, I mean, of the local people in, in, in these new sectors, because um, I keep going, going back you know, to the, uh, to the 70s, uh, I mean, because it was also a period where Denmark modernized Greenland uh, and brought in thousands and thousands of Danish workers, you know, in the construction and education sector because we were supposed to become, you know, uh, uh, at the same level as names, but in that process, you know, it, it created a, a social discontent and frustration, you know, that led to this movement uh, because essentially we were becoming spectators to the development of our own country. So we are very, you know, aware of, you know, that any development, um, any new development that we are uh, undertaking, you know, has to have, you know, its roots and uh, in, in the different uh, localities and, you know, the different uh, um, um, towns, you know, that are experiencing, for example, um, um, development in terms of the mineral sector, you know, has to be part of that. So, um, and it's really into the, you know, our Mineral Resources Act uh, that there should be an impact benefit agreement. And that basically means that, you know, the company that has the license and the municipality where, you know, the uh, mine will be operating as well as the uh, government of Greenland has to make a uh, uh, three-part agreement that, that deals with, you know, um, both, um, I mean, the, the status as to the um, involvement of local employees and uh, locally based companies that they're going to use, as well as a, a, um, a goal, you know, of increasing that. So, so you know, so that the local um, benefit, you know, will be at the, at the greatest. Um, so that's something that we are, um, as I said, you know, very much aware now, based on our historical um, experiences, you know, with the development uh, uh, that has been dictated, you know, for, uh, by others. Thank you, Inutik. And David, I hope that answered your question um, sufficiently. And otherwise, you can, of course, raise your hand again and uh, ask more questions. I now have to uh, ask you a question of uh, coming from Michael Maurer, who asked me to ask the question in, for him. It's about uh, Greenland's relationship with the Arctic Council. since. Uh, your representation goes through Denmark, or, or we assume you're represented in the Arctic Council via Denmark. Does Greenland command Denmark's priorities in the Council, or are there any differences between the two and uh, between both countries, uh, what they want to see in the Arctic? And this comes again from Michael Maurer, and he thanks mm -hmm. you for answering taking that question. Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Michael. Um, um, it's, it's, um, you're right. I mean, it is Denmark that's officially, you know, the member um, 
in the Arctic Council. Uh, but Denmark is also aware, you know, that the backbone of its uh, Arctic uh, um, identity is through Greenland. Um, and we've been, I mean, Greenland, you know, uh, actually, um, I started my career after I graduated from the university in 1996, you know, which was the year where the Arctic Council was established. So I remember, you know, colleagues of mine that uh, uh, traveled uh, frequently, you know, to do the different negotiations uh, that led to the uh, creation of the Arctic Council. So Greenland has been very much engaged from the beginning, uh, also prior to uh, the creation of the Arctic Council. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, this was way before, you know, um, uh, there was this global interest in, in the Arctic. Uh, so we've been very much aware that, uh, that you know, um, all, always still very much aware that our, you know, um, regional place is through, you know, uh, institutions like the Arctic Council, because, uh, I mean, uh, as I said before, and I'll say it again, you know, I think it's very important that that we are sitting uh, at the table as part of the negotiations. I mean, uh, uh, part of the negotiating team on issues that directly affects, you know, um, um, I mean, us as well as the people uh, um, in and in and around Greenland as well as the Arctic. So I mean, it's not always. I mean, we don't always agree, but you know, uh, with Denmark, um, uh, and that's not, not only that's not only limited to you know the Arctic Council. It's also uh, uh, expands to other um, other other areas as, uh, as well as other questions that where we have to deal uh, with Denmark. Uh, but so it's but we try to get you know uh, get the most best out of it, and, and we're very much aware that you know. Um, uh, rights that we have at attained throughout the years, uh, because uh, in several ministerial, for example, instances, it's been a Greenland minister or premier that has led the delegation on behalf of the, of the Kingdom of Denmark. And in several of the working groups, it will be someone from the government of Greenland, you know, that's that's uh, sitting at the, as the um, head of delegation. Um, so, I mean, those. Uh, are something that you know we hold dear and which we will you know continue to uh, fight for, and, uh, and that's not going to be uh, you know reduced uh, um, in the coming years. Uh, but um, um, but so we I mean we try to have a, a good working relationship you know with Denmark on, on issues like that, uh, and so far I mean. Um, on, on, in most issues and cases, you know, it's been working out, it's working well, but there are also some other issues where, um, yeah, we, we still have disagreements, for example. Excellent. Thank you, Inutek. Uh, that, that's uh, great. I would have a personal question. Uh, you outlined some options for economic development. Some of them are already underway, such as the mining expansion or expansion of mining activities or new mines. And then also you mentioned tourism and also deep sea ports and, and shipping activities, the new sea lanes. So in how far do you, uh, do you have an idea of a green economy for Greenland, or in how far does environmental or uh, sustainability or uh, ecosystem um, protection matter or play a role in the planning of economic or, or industrial development yeah. for yeah. Greenland? Yeah. You know, um, I'm often asked, you know, uh, why is it called Greenland when, when it's, you know, uh, only white? Uh, but uh, when it comes to the green energy, it's actually very green because um, that's uh, I think around seventy percent of our electricity consumption comes from green, uh, renewable energies, uh, and that's uh, you know, um, hydropower. And there's still potential for much more, also in an in, in industrial uh, scale. You know, in terms of um, energy-intensive industries where we have some untapped. Um, energy potentials, you know, um, 
when it comes to hydropower. And that's actually just uh, um, a research uh, project that was uh, started, I think it was last week, in a small village uh, because uh, the issue with um, energy in Greenland, and that's also a, 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 a critical issue in many parts of the Arctic, is that um, we are relying on, relying on uh, uh, diesel, you know, for uh, energy production, for electricity and, uh, and other kind of um, and heating. And uh, but in this small village, you know, we are uh, the energy company in Greenland is uh, have set up. Uh, both solar panels and wind panels, you know, um, to try to, uh, you know, offset um, the diesel consumption. And that's something, uh, I mean, I think it was in 2006 or seven. you know, um, energy prices hit like 150 US dollars per barrel. And that's, you know, suddenly becomes very, very expensive to, uh, to, uh, uh, produce electricity, especially if you are depend so dependent on diesel. So uh, there is definitely a future for uh, much more uh, green energy. Um, and we have the potential for that. But one of the challenges is to, uh, you know, um, they're not connected. The, diff the energy uh, grid is not connected. So that's something that we have to that we are looking into. Or actually, with uh, um, it's a one of the bigger German companies, um, and as to how we can develop you know, both the uh, renewable energy but also connect you know the, the energy grid uh, from you know, location to location because right now they are you know um, separate islands so to speak in terms of energy infrastructure, um, but as dependent we, as we are on the environment. Of course, there was, I mean, there's a great consciousness uh, when it comes to environmental issues. Um, because, uh, as I said, you know, fisheries is our biggest uh, industry and will continue to be so. So, um, um, so the, I mean, so we have to handle these different environmental you know, um, challenges when it comes to, for example, in, in mineral de mining development as well as other kind of uh, developments. Uh, um, and address you know, different environmental issues, uh, questions that arise from those in the best possible way. Because, but because I mean, we have we have seen you know what um, the destruction you know that uh, take place uh, elsewhere in the past and you know, elsewhere around the world. And I mean, the, and I think, but I think with new new ways of, of doing things, you know, uh, uh, new technologies, uh, uh, better practices. Uh, as, you know, times I think is with us because the thing that we don't need is you know is to repeat what past uh, experiences uh, have been around the world when it comes to environmental issues. Well, thank you, thank you for answering this, and very interesting to hear that your your challenge is that you have a lot of renewable electricity already in your. Uh, total electricity consumption, but of course also challenges with interconnecting or connecting uh, smaller settlements or towns and villages to the grid. And we heard actually about the same topic last week from a startup from Alaska called 60 Hertz, which is working on, uh, on, on uh, making uh, microgrid solutions integrating renewable electricity and uh, diesel as backup, still maintaining this, so bringing in um, renewables into the equation and, and then lowering the total energy cost and creating more reliable power source as well. Interesting, of course, the different approaches and you, you look also to Europe, to Germany, um, because that's obviously for you also a field to look to. Excellent. We have one more question from the participants and that's from Lisa Covino and she asked me to ask the question. So I'll do my very best to, to, um, to ask the question and, and uh, make it clear. So it's about the impacts of climate change um, for Greenland, both in terms of uh, resource development or economic development and then via that also impacts 
on the likelihood of a future independent Greenland uh, linked to climate change. And I, I would like to add to that, I just recently saw a documentary about um, the, the uh, potential, the possibility of melting of the inland ice cap in, in Greenland, at least partial melting. And so what this would mean also for land use opportunities and or also issues in terms of thawing of, of, the, of the ground. Mm. Maybe you can answer at least this partially. I know it's very broad and very complex, but maybe just a few, few ideas. Thank you. No, um, I think it's a very relevant one because uh, uh, because of the ice cap, you know, um, which falls around, I think it's 10% of the uh, fresh water uh, uh, globally, and then, you know, Antarctic, you know, is the 90%. But still, I think uh, Greenland represents, I think, globally speaking, you know, some kind of a threat when it comes to. Uh, uh, sea level rise. That's, that's especially something that's, um, you know, as I, when I'm dealing, you know, uh, with different constituents here in the US, yeah, and, you know, when I mention that, that I'm from Greenland, you know, they'll very often, you know, uh, relate Greenland to uh, climate change because of this, uh, because it's especially um, here, you know, I think it's around, you know, Florida and you know, Virginia and other Coastal, uh, uh, coastal areas. I mean, it, it, it represents a real uh, threat. You know, uh, when we talk about uh, flooding, uh, that they are seeing much more uh, often instances of, uh, as well as you know, uh, with this continued um, projection of uh, of higher uh, levels of the, of the of the sea rise. Um, when it comes to, I mean, um, um, in terms of, for example, the uh, different economic um, issues, for example, when it comes to minerals or other uh, sectors, they're not so much, you know, kind of related to uh, the issue of uh, climate change. But climate change, you know, is, I mean, is um, uh, as been, uh, it's probably been said by others that it's more, um, um, I mean, the Arctic is much more affected, you know, in terms of uh, the different effects uh, of climate change than, uh, than other areas uh, in the world. And that's something that both uh, comes with negative um, issues as well as some more uh, positive uh, uh, issues as, as we see it. The negative uh, um, effects are very much related to the you know, ancient culture of, uh, that we've been relying on when it comes to you know, hunting, uh, um, as well as traveling by, uh, on, on uh, sea ice. Um, because those who are um, much more dependent on, you know, um, on, for example, hunting in smaller, much smaller isolated communities are feeling the effects much more uh, harshly uh, than those, for example, on the most southern end, you know, where they are seeing, where we have seed farms, for example, that are seeing prolonged, uh, a longer growing seasons, uh, where that we are also, you know, uh, being affected by in a more positive sense. Um, so, um, so it's affecting the, you know, the uh, ancient traditions of, you know, dark state as well as uh, uh, knowledge about you know how to navigate sea ice as well as you know uh, uh, very old uh, traditional um, um, uh, trades as, and, and traditions and you know uh, uh, intergenerational you know knowledge that's being passed on. Uh, so th that's where the threat, biggest threat, threat is. But in terms of the other. Um, I mean, in terms of, for example, shipping in a, in a, uh, on the different uh, coasts from north to south, especially when you talk about the more northern uh, uh, towns, I mean, you know, you, you can use uh, ships uh, to, to move goods and fishery, uh, fish products around in and out, you know, uh, in a longer period, which um, 
everything being equal is, is, is cheaper than you know, having to fly in, for example, you know, uh, products uh, that people are dependent on. Uh, so um, so it, it really depends you know, on um, both the, um, I think, geographical scope um, and what people are dependent on. Um, but also looking at you know, um, you know what positive effects can be uh, uh, reaped off because with, I mean ch when we talk about change and that is not only uh, relegated to climate you know, change but also any kind of change you know there's always you know something uh, positive as well as something negative that comes with it so you just have I think awareness is you know, it's a big uh, issue in, in that sense of how to mitigate the, the, the um, uh, negative effects while we get uh, the positive you know, effects of any change. Well, excellent. I think that's, that's exactly um, the, the challenge, right? Knowing there are definitely advantages and there are risks or disadvantages or costs associated to the change in in the climate and so seeing what it means what it means locally regionally and, and globally is definitely a challenge and, and you're definitely more exposed to this in greenland than in people in more southern latitudes or moderate latitudes uh Inotik, thank you so much for joining us for this session here at the arctic summer college today I'm really glad this worked out. Um, I found your contributions, your input extremely fascinating to hear firsthand what's happening, what's also planned to happen also uh, in Greenland and with the long-term transition process towards sovereignty, towards independence uh, in, in this context of a changing climate. I mean, that's really the, the interesting. So you have multiple factors changing over time and uh, navigating it uh, while uh, running also a country, while also doing everything else that's necessary at the same time. So thank you very much for being here today with us. Uh, I want to thank, us, of course, also all the participants for asking questions and following uh, up on aspects. I uh, want to just highlight that next week we have, of course, two new speakers, and I just wanted to uh, name them real quickly. Of course, you can see this also on our website on arcticsummercollege.org, where you also find uh, the information about past sessions, but also the upcoming sessions. Information is updated as, uh, as information becomes available, so it's not not everything is there uh, at the every moment, but it's coming in. It's a uh, moving process. So next week, August 9th, uh, we have two speakers. One is Stefan Schott from Carlton University, and he's talking about food security and sustainable fisheries in the Arctic. So that actually links directly to Inotech. You mentioned that main income source for you is fisheries. And then the second speaker is Alexei Tsikarev talking about indigenous people specifically. Um, that's of course broad because it's not just one place, but he talks about them in, in general and uh, specifically why it's happening next uh, Wednesday on August 9th as far as uh, that's the World Indigenous people stay so that's a good uh, reason to have a special focus on the indigenous peoples I'm really excited about these two presentations as well I hope you'll be all able to join us next week and of course Inotech you're also uh, more than welcome if you want to join us uh, anytime let me know and I'll give you a login so you can join and see what other people are saying it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Otherwise, I say uh, thank you and goodbye and have a great rest of your day. And um, also a nice, nice summer, nice August, and hope to see you sometime soon again uh, in Washington or otherwise maybe in Greenland or in Iceland at the Arctic Circle Assembly. Uh, anyway, have a great day. Take care and bye-bye, everybody.
Thank you. Yeah.